plus stuff in here. Uh, it's mainly about uh, dependency management as an idea. Um, it extends to anything that uh, encode that needs Thank you. And declares dependencies, which would be any language. And then uh, the container stuff, which is pretty simple um, overview of the container uh, in kind of a generic uh, app API set. And that should apply to some C++ stuff as well. Um, so I'm Michael Jones. Thanks for coming out. Um, I work at Microsoft and have been in the industry for a while. And have kind of enjoyed these meetings. And it's my first time talking at one of them. So, um, my, some of my slides are going to be a little small on code print. I hope not too small to read. So depending, my talk on dependency management, basically, hopefully we get to uh, hear about my path to caring about dependency management, uh, some definitions to set the uh, sort of stage for some of the items we talk about in the talk, um, some software development goals that I have and how dependency management basically is a, a set of tools that, can, uh, that I can leverage to uh, get there. Um, I use the term industrial strength development to kind of say that uh, this is the, the quality of code that we want to write and I want to work within and how dependency management and some techniques uh, can get you there as well. And then into the dependency management patterns and anti-patterns, uh, some dependency injection container stuff, uh, and then components and modules and putting it all together to actually develop an app that uh, is industrial strength. So my path to dependency management, uh, I was introduced to the Unity uh, library, which was written by Microsoft Patterns and Practices Group. Um, it is a dependency injection container, and we'll get to what that actually means. Um, but after being introduced to the library and being uh, introduced to code that was using it and trying to use it myself, uh, Mark Seaman has written a book called Dependency Injection in .NET. Uh, I brought a copy, my copy right there. Uh, it's a, he's a good reference to dependency injection and patterns um, and how to actually uh, both express and, and use patterns in your, in your code. Uh, his book, I think, is a little outdated from 2011, the first edition. He's written a, a decent amount more on his blog. His blog is a really nice blog to follow. Uh, and it looks, I just looked this up, but it looks like he's creating a second edition that's coming out this year. Uh, in his book, he basically goes over some patterns and then talks about some of the existing containers that uh, are available in .NET. Uh, in .NET, I, I really mean sort of C Sharp uh, as the language that I'm, I'm using there. Um, Castle Windsor is a project that's been active for a long time and includes a couple of uh, different libraries that uh, help you develop uh, an application in various ways, one of them being dependency injection and the container uh, as an object that you can use and take advantage of there. Autofac is a similar scenario where it's a library, a dependency injection library that's available for .NET and C Sharp. And then um, reading some of Martin Fowler's books on patterns and practices on kind of putting all the things together of how you should um, pattern some software and then using dependency management and possibly a dependency injection container to stitch everything together, keeping things, um, keeping components uh, less coupled and more easily maintained, testable, deployable, and industrial strength. So for definitions throughout the talk, um, I kind of have two things that I go back and forth between, sort of what is a component and what is a module, uh, and I try to define them. These are kind of my definitions. Uh, a component for this talk is an implementation of a single abstraction with the intent of being provided as a dependency to other components. So you kind of think of this as examples of, hey, I have a, a basic settings provider that is implemented to get settings out of an app config, which is a kind of a standard Windows uh, .NET settings repository, and it implements the interface by basic settings provider. So that would be a component, the basic settings provider implementation implementing the abstraction that's an interface. 
same with something like a type settings provider where potentially a basic settings provider would provide um, sort of a single root type, say a string, no matter what you asked it for. The type, would, the type settings provider would potentially be able to convert that thing into what you actually need an int or something else. So those are examples of components. And then what is a module? A module is a collection of component choices used to satisfy sort of, quote, most dependencies of larger application function. So uh, in this sense, uh, you, I can um, think of a general purpose function that's sort of larger, but my application actually just needs to read configuration. And an implementation of, or a expression of, of the configuration dependencies as a module potentially might be the Azure Cloud Service uh, configuration dependencies. So the Azure Cloud Service configuration dependencies are a collection of components that are basically choosing for various implementations the, the implementation for various interfaces, the implementations that would provide configuration as a package to your application by by reading stuff out of the Azure Cloud Service settings package. So specifically, something like that might provide multiple components, such as a basic settings provider, type conversion provider, and various converters to actually convert from basic string types into uh, more uh, complex types, time spans, integers, whatever. So my software development goals, I basically want to build succinct, configurable, customizable, adaptable, and reproducer, reproducible enterprise applications on top of industrial strings components. So in there, um, succinct kind of, to me, just means I can briefly express intent of, of what I want to do or what I'm choosing. Something like, hey, I want to choose um, to use this Azure configuration package to read my configurations out of Azure Cloud Service um, settings files. And to do that succinctly would be um, somewhere in code to make that uh, choice be a small amount of code in the application because the application really doesn't care too much about where it gets its settings providers from. It just needs to choose sort of a, uh, the module it wants to have provide that. And then it moves on with its business logic knowing that uh, reading settings are, are available. So configurable, customizable, and adaptable, those are uh, terms that the components, if the components carry those properties, we can build, we can build things that can be uh, put into and collected into modules. And, and then the idea is that hopefully those become something that um, can form a foundation out of, that our application can be built from. And if we can make it easy to select which, which versions of those or which implementations of those, um, we can spend more time working on the business logic of the application as opposed to the fundamental um, sort of baseline framework of it. So I think you said the, co the code, the application code chooses the module or the component. Does it really do that, or does it specify the interface it wants to use? Is um, so th this will be, uh, I think, uh, covered in later slides in a sense that we, the, the application code or any component code is going to express that it needs a dependency, and it'll do that through an interface. Yeah. I need this dependency. I want to um, express that through, you know, using a, an interface. And then the choice of the implementation that goes into uh, being provided to that component that needs that dependency um, comes from somewhere. Yeah. And that, that somewhere is where you choose it and then how you choose it. Um, part of the talk is like um, how you can choose that at a component level and then maybe putting a sort of a modular uh, layer on top of that to choose a bunch of components at the same time. But your application code doesn't have 
specify which one it's going to choose, right? It just it basically wants to call a function that's in some interface. Yeah. Uh, and then the term reproducible I, I use here in a sense that uh, we write a lot of software and we write a number of applications and the reproducibility of being able to reuse components, easily choose which components we want, um, making that, uh, that end application uh, be industrial strength in the sense that the, it knows the components are, that it's using are tested um, durable and um, can adapt to the various environments that it needs to be in, uh, making it sort of friendly to use. Uh, that reproducibility is important to me because um, because of the multiple application sort of entries into reusing components. So for industrial strength, um, Again, just like the characteristics of what is the term industrial strength. This is sort of what I've been thinking. Well designed, well tested, durable, performance, secure, transparent, ready to work. Uh, these are how components should be built. They should have these characteristics. But how do we actually build those components is part of the question. The practical principles of using these components, they should be dev friendly, test friendly, ops friendly. Uh, the dev shouldn't be afraid to in integrate them into their code. Uh, they should be testable in a sense that I can run them in production, but then I can also hook up uh, mocks and stubs and uh, be able to test them under unit tests. And then ops friendly, uh, they need to be able to be deployed into, into various uh, environments from you know, working on my local desktop in a local host scenario to uh, being deployed into pre-production environment or dog food environments or all the way out to production environments. And then the design principles that we'll cover next that are the principles I use to follow or I find the best uh, to look at and remind myself to follow sort of are the principles that actually allow me to write and construct code that have these characteristics and practical principles. Solid and dry. <laughs> yeah. You want to go into those? Solid. solid. <coughs> okay. Yeah, so, so solid now, dry next. Uh, so SOLID is sort of a well-known acronym in um, the development community. This is basically what it means, S-O-L-I-D. So yeah. SOLID, single responsibility, open for extension, a Liskov substitution principle, an interface segregation principle, and a dependency inversion principle. So for single responsibility, um, basically, if you have a, if you define, if you're trying to define a component in code, um, keeping it, having a well-defined single responsibility allows you to create an interface that's very short, um, has only what you need to to do that, you know, to perform that responsibility, and it allows you to build more simple building blocks where you can have multiple, potentially multiple implementations of that uh, component, and you don't have a lot of extra stuff to build when you don't really care about that extra stuff in a certain scenario. So your scenario should, should sort of define what these responsibilities are. The components themselves should have, um, there should be a number of components themselves that have the single responsibilities that, that through a dependency graph could together create and do the work that the that the, the the program in full needs to do. So open for extension and close for modification. This pretty much to me just kind of means that you know create interfaces and abstractions 
for your components and don't really create a component that then gets used as the concrete type. The, the abstract class or the interface becomes this item that, that really doesn't have you know, code around it. It just defines what the dependent will actually be interfacing with. And then when you actually do want to have an implementation of that, um, you know exactly what you need to implement and you don't really modify that, um, you don't really modify that contract because the, the dependents will be using your implementation through the interface. So for Liskov substitution principle, this basically means that if I have an interface and I depend on it, that I should be able to have a, a number of implementations that I can swap out and provide back to that dependent. Um, the, the, the component that depends on me uh, without affecting correctness. And this can be difficult. Um, it is desirable to be able to do this, to have a bunch of components off the shelf that you can sort of choose and not affect um, correctness. And maybe you're affecting something else, performance or something else. Um, it is difficult, but sort of don't let that difficulty um, and the actual principle itself deter you from doing the other items if you didn't think that, oh, well, I can't really make an implementation for the way that I want it to because it really wouldn't be substitutable. Uh, maybe some other things need to change to rework that sort of design to fit there. The interface segregation principle, uh, basically kind of a, um, a pairing with the single responsibility in a sense that more specific interfaces are better than fewer general ones. So a lot of interfaces with single responsibility is better than a giant um, interface that, that has too much fat. And so but the uh, star is a sort of a note. I think type parameterized interfaces sort of help keep you dry. Dry is don't repeat yourself. And in this case, um, having this line, many specific interfaces, you can find where this interface and this interface roughly look like they're doing the same thing. They're providing a resource or a piece of data. It's just a different type. So why don't we just make those interfaces be parameterized on type, and you can have a single uh, interface definition that is parameterized, even though when you actually instantiate it or declare it with various types, you have many of them. But your dependency is with a specific type in mind, right? Uh, yeah, but you can build sort of other, you know, type parameterized um, items that just pass types through. <coughs> and then dependency inversion principle is depend on abstractions, not concretions or implementations. Uh, this allows you to do a lot of stuff which um, basically use components, select components, interchange components. And with all of these together, you have a good starting point for building some industrial strength. Components and code. So can you go back? Sure. Where does the phrase inversion, why is inversion in that phrase? Um, What's, what are you inverting? Yeah, so, so the inversion part is uh, um, probably not on the side related to what I, I talked about there. The inversion part um, really becomes about the dependency injection uh, and the ideas around dependency injection where uh, sort of this idea, another sort of term for that is a Hollywood principle in a don't call us, we'll call you in a way that you are saying, I want this abstraction and I don't care who really provides it. Somebody else external to me will provide it as long as it functions um, you know, the way that I expect through the interface contract. And so eventually you will have something that um, needs to know what to provide and there are various ways to providing that dependency and providing that dependency is, is um, the injection part and the inversion part here The inversion part here becomes something like 
there is something that is responsible for that, but it should be um, sort of nowhere close to the the implementation of getting the job done. I don't. So uh, I'll, I can give you a concrete example because we do this on my team. I was doing it today. Um, so you have a bunch of different objects. Uh, you often hear the phrase in the DI world, new is glue. And so if you're newing an object inside your constructor, you're doing it wrong. And so that's what they're talking about when they're talking about inversion. You're saying, give me this thing from the outside world instead of me creating a new one for myself. So that, that's, that's the, the, the inversion refers to the fact that it's coming from the outside as opposed to you creating and owning it for yourself. Is how, is how I've heard it. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't, because I mean, the way I see dependency, map dependency is A depends on B. Yes. Bringing in the notion of inversion is almost letting you say, actually B depends on the notion of the knowledge of A. Yes. Is that not, uh, am I just thinking about that wrong? Yeah, in, in this particular <laughs> case, yes. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that's how they chose to use it, because most people knew up their objects inside their constructor, and so they're saying, invert that, don't knew it inside, knew it outside. But, it's, but that's not a, that's not and that's not an inversion on dependency itself. It's an inversion on who's providing the dependency. Are you providing the dependency or someone else? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think in that in that case, A depends on B, but really B is defined by an, an interface, an abstraction, and really B is really provided by an implementation C and D that implement B. Right, so which but, which is but there's never, which any, is there's never any back dependency on anything to A, is there? No. No. Inversion no, seems no. to me like the swapping the direction of a pointer. No, no. that's not what it's in no, yeah, logic. It's, it's not. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll shut up. Of course, if you can get past <laughs> the fact that they're calling B, which is dependent on by A, a dependency. <laughs> To me, a dependency is a relationship, and suddenly they're using that as this noun. <coughs> and would, and would, on. And would you say that dependency is a one-way relationship? Typically. Yeah. 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 Uh, so dry is don't repeat yourself. And so how do we do that? Um, single responsibility comes up at the top again, and once you kind of create a bunch of small interfaces and small components implementing that, um, you know, you can really sort of see the, that that is simple to, to sort of start with. And it seems like what happens is you start there and then something sort of leaks in, in a sense that it becomes a little bit fat, the interface becomes a little bit fatter and implement, all the implementations now have to like implement that and if it continues to happen, your single responsibility isn't sort of held as a principle anymore, and um, it's sort of harder to treat that item as a as a tiny component. It's very well defined. And so again, configurable abstract abstractions, um, basically parameterizing those abstractions as best you can, allows you to have sort of a small number of them that are parameterized, and then you can use them by choosing the parameters in different ways. So this is kind of your your kind of addition to the dependency in general, right? It's more like your because it's not that that uh, it's not part of the dependency injection itself, right? Yeah, right. <clears throat> so dependency injection um, is sort of a technique on side inside of dependency management. It's kind of what I'm <coughs> I'm trying to. Yeah. Do. So I consider this kind of your personal on top of that, like this principle. Uh, yeah. So I do think that these. Um, solid and dry principles, and a few these would become my pointers into how to uh, how to um, comply with being in solid and being in dry principles. These are just my pointers into how how to comply to that. And if you comply, then further down the road, when you start to talk about actually injecting dependencies or just providing dependencies, things become uh, potentially easier for you. So, as an example of configurable abstractions, um, one of the things that one of the things that I like as a as a principle here is to start with abstractions 
uh, define reusable baseline of abstractions to build from. And as, as an example, I'll start with abstractions better than twofold. Mm -hmm. They have a result. A lot of times it's a value that comes with a status and potentially something else. Um, instead of having a tuple that defines or that returns that, um, you know, start to create an interface that is parameterized, and then you can create common implementations that become building blocks for, you know, future interfaces that you define. And once you kind of define your those newer, complex, more complex interfaces using these base components, you kind of start to build and really craft um, like the flavor of the code that you're writing. And that flavor is now expressed, hopefully, in um, components that meet these solid and dry principles. So once you start with like a, uh, you start with something simple, like what I just, a replacement for tuple, uh, you can start to add more to the baseline and you'll see my examples throughout will be about the settings provider. Here I have a very simple <clears throat> interface on the left, basic settings provider. Really the only thing it does is it's parameterized on the key that you actually will use to obtain the setting and the basic type that you will always get back. Um, from anything that implements this. So very simply, this can easily be implemented as the key type is a string and the basic type is a string and a whole lot of settings providers for Windows um, basically function like this through their API. And so providing implementations on the right of app config, web config, JSON if you want, um, become simple implementations. But a lot of times, we don't like to deal with strings, or I wouldn't suggest dealing with strings as your settings because really they're int. And to get a string and where you use it, convert it to int, um, would not be a good pattern. So coming up with the single responsibility interfaces on the left of what would be required to implement something on the right, which is a generalized typed setting provider. What I have is an interface for conversion, <coughs> something that would actually give me a converter given the two types that I have, and then the type settings provider itself, which would give me the typed um, instance of the setting that I asked for. And so on the right, Uh, so on the right, we have the, right here, the implementation of my single responsibility interface, which is defined down here. Right here, there's a constructor that has two parameters. Both of them are abstractions. And, and basically, the base midpoint on the right. Yeah, it's, it's really sort of not it's all over here. Go ahead, sorry. We're colorblind. So, <laughs> so, so right here is the constructor for this thing. It has two parameters, a basic settings provider and a type conversion provider from a basic. And this guy will give you something, uh, get type conversion to any two sort of at the call site. Uh, basically, then you actually keep keep those uh, two dependencies as properties, property members, and then the only implementation of the function is to, from the basic settings provider, get the basic value, get a type conversion provider from, from that uh, dependency, and call the convert on it at that spot. So there's a complexity of interface, single responsibility interfaces on the left, an implementation of something on the uh, right that is uh, still simple, but is basically declaring that I'm going to do this with dependencies outside of, uh, that are going to be provided outside of myself. And whoever that does provide those um, dependencies, I will just use them in a certain way. So do you have an example where you actually declare that dependency 
like the module that's actually using this interface or one of the instances? Because um, you're just showing all the different implementations of that particular interface, right? But where is the code that actually uses that interface? Yeah, I'll, hopefully I'll get there. Oh, sorry. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, and then uh, we can kind of do something like this where we la layer complexity. So on the left, I have another implementation of the type settings provider where I'm passing through this parameterize, um, this type parameter. And really this thing on the left is called key transformed type settings provider. The only thing really it's going to do is when you ask it for uh, setting foo, it's somehow going to transform that setting name into something different and then ask, ask um, the type settings provider that it is configured to use for that transformed name. And with that guy, I can create a something simple, a section scope type settings provider. And right here on the left, where I have this, this thing is dependent on a transform key function. It takes a key and turns it into a key. Over here, I can say this transform function is to take this section path and sort of, you, you know, pin to it somehow. Um, the key that comes in here. That will happen through this call right here of transforming my name. <coughs> and really what this thing does is it just appends as if the section path is a path and it just appends to the end of it. So for instance, my section is um, my database, um, you know, some database name and the key that I asked for um, through the section scoped one uh, settings provider is um, connection string. And really the, the setting that is provided is uh, my database name dot connection string. But right here, the, the goal of this slide is to sort of show how comp the, the components can kind of be used, the baseline components can kind of be used and layered up to create sort of more complexity uh, and in the same time keeping things you know, relatively simple and single responsibility. The key transform settings provider, his only responsibility really is to transform the name and pass the name on slightly transform. So for this to be in use, um, so I have a component, it has some settings. The settings are actually different types, strings, ints, time spans. On the right, I have two implementations. The top one is a plain old data structure with get and set. It implements my component settings. And then the bottom half is my component settings from settings provider. It implements my component settings. It takes the type settings provider and eventually asks at the bottom the type settings provider to get the type setting, which is a string, which is uh, the name of it is the, you know, the name of the setting it's trying to read. And same with int, same with time span. And so here I have um, an interface for my component settings, and I have two different implementations on how I can provide that. One, the top one of the plain old data is a simple, quick, I just need to call this guy and I need to just give him some inline settings, I can use that top one with no problem. The bottom one is, hey, I, I have this access to a type settings provider, which is someone external to me has hooked that up hopefully correctly. And they have chosen to read their basic settings from app config. They've collected their, um, their converters that, are, that they'd like to use or required to use um, based on the types. They have a type converter pro converting provider to give me the right converter depending on the type input. And ultimately, they've created this type settings provider and given it to me. And the only thing I do in this case is read it, or read those setting values. And so what's nice here is with the sort of the keyed transform or the scoped um, settings provider, um, this this guy right here um, 
is really doesn't even know what uh, like where these settings string value, int value, and string so this be time span value are located. So th that scoped settings provider can someone external to to this guy can say actually the the scope you should be looking at is sort of buried in the JSON, and now it can be moved easily, and my settings provider can be rescoped and provided to the to this guy the same way. So the lie in the top class is the fact that all the code involved in the sets have been are hard coded and they're sitting somewhere else specifically for each item pulled specifically from each place. And in the bottom half, even though it reads more complex, you generalize that out and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, yeah, the top the top class doesn't know where it's really getting the values provided from it. The user of the top class. Yeah. He's going to have to write the code that does the setter and the bottom <laughs> one. He doesn't. Yeah. But I mean, the, the top class is useful, especially in like unit test cases where you're just like, I'm, look, I'm not going to set up a whole sort of settings file or provider or whatever. I really know what settings I want to test, and I just want to provide them in line with a plain old data structure that's going to be my, uh, you know, satisfy my component settings interface or contract, and then I can use the component under test with that. And so how does a component actually get used to, or how does a component get created? Here I have my component as an interface, my component as an implementation that implements my component. It declares its dependency through a constructor parameter, my component settings. I keep a copy of that with a um, read-only c -sharp property. Um, and then on the right, I need to do something to create one of those components. And when I actually create one of the, the components, I actually need to provide the dependencies that it expects. On the right, I have two versions of my component. One of them is using the plain old data sort of settings provider, my, my component settings provider. And the bottom is using a um, component settings provider my component settings from settings provider with an example of how you can use a scope type settings provider to say this is the sort of buried path to you know this JSON object let's say or a prefix let's say and then I need the pass the type settings provider and then I choose to get this out of app config and for conversion I choose to use in .NET, we have a system .change type, which does a conversion from most things to most other things. And I'm not really making a claim that this is something exact, like we'll, that will provide conversion to and from everything, but it is something that we can use, and if we know that we're limited and it supports what we need, then it works. So just this one is just sort of like an example of more baseline, more baseline abstractions that you could imagine. Uh, I already talked about basic settings provider, convert, which has a convert function, convert and uh, like get type conversion, get type settings, and then factories and data access patterns of, hey, I have a factory that takes an argument and produces a product, and return it as an I result of the product. A resource provider is sort of just another version of factory, um, but sort of fits more of like a data access um, idea or name uh, or API. Hey, I really just want to provide some resource given this key, and I get it back here as a sort of a keyed resource um, result. Uh, formatting, you know, I can have item formatters and that, that uh, return some kind of structured message type or item to string or filtering. I, I have something and I just need to apply. You know, I have, I have something that is, that is typed for me and I need to apply the of to the to all the time. And some example baseline implementations, they have an 
order factory. The factory has takes takes arguments and produces orders. I have a resource provider. I can write a resource provider on top of a standard dictionary. That's pretty simple. Um, convert change type is um, you know just actually implementing the convert function of from this to that. So, if you keep sort of extending the, the, the ideas and patterns here, we can get to a spot where, hey, I, I have these sort of larger functional components um, to, to allow me to create these industrial strength pieces. And remember, the, the industrial strength pieces end up being um, things to make um, dev friend, your code dev friendly, test friendly, ops friendly. Uh, something that becomes adaptable, I can deploy it in a number of environments by picking the right things. I can test it because I can create stub implementations or mock implementations. And down here it kind of likes the idea that, hey, I'm kind of defining a, you know, some service, external or not. Uh, define it as an interface. I have a real one, I have a stub one. The, something like the diagnostics are, I have diagnostics, but really diagnostics when I'm hooked into Azure are completely different than when I'm not hooked into Azure and I'm under unit tests or I'm in just a local environment. Uh, and so really if I even tried to hook into the Azure diagnostics, let's say, potentially doesn't work in my local desktop environment, it has to actually be within a runtime. So really this is just a repeat slide Single responsibility, open for extension interfaces, uh, the substitution part, you can kind of see how that uh, plays. And, um, you know, with the basic settings provider, those, those are easily substitutable. Um, segregating our interfaces by creating type parameterized interfaces. Um, and then depending on the abstractions and making those declarations of dependence through constructor by passing in interface um, parameters. So with solid drive principles in place, how do we manage component dependencies? Uh, the dependency declarations, uh, you've seen in the examples come through the constructor as parameters. And then when we have those declarations, those parameters, we're defining what parameter actually goes here. Uh, in that sense, you have a choice, you know, what type is that? Depend on those abstractions that you've defined. Uh, I haven't gone over this a lot, but in the, um, let's see. So right here, this property is this dependency that's coming in through the constructor, and it is um, defaults to private get only which basically in C sharp means that I can only make this, I can only set this value in the constructor and making that mutable sort of can potentially lead to um, issues. And so to start with the, with private only and get only uh, will save you a lot of, uh, will save you a lot if you need it to be settable um, it's sort of something I think about as in why do I really need this thing to be settable because it, then you start to get into mutability and mutability has issues when you start talking about your object and threads and lifetimes and multiple people using it at the same time. But that also means you have to know it all at that point when you do the instantiation. Whereas if, if you have like a setter you can, you can postpone that to some other part of the code that makes that decision. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> In this, or in, I would say that in the, the this dependency management space, um, you do want to try and have those values in the constructor. And if you if you do think you need that set to be able to set in different spots, um, it becomes a, a question of 
you know, why is that really happening, and can we can we make adjustments to put it to where we know it, things are in the constructor. And you can provide those dependencies through like a lazy instantiation and things like that that uh, may not be exactly what you mean, but there are some other you know, techniques for that. Also, if you have a circular reference, you have to do it in two steps. Yeah. Uh, so dependency selection we'll get to. Uh, how do I choose these dependencies and dependency lifetime? And so a dependency declaration, how do we actually like declare dependencies various ways? There's a package reference, assembly reference, an import statement at the top of the file. Uh, there's a constructor parameter. And this one is bold because it's really the one you should you should really think about using and using only. Um, these other top ones are uh, not exactly the the same style, but as a uh, as a choice between as a constructor parameter or as a field property, um, because the field would require to be settable from the from external, you just kind of give up some things to make that happen and as a method variable. <coughs> Uh, depend on abstractions, it's basically what um, the constructor is doing in, in making its parameter the interface version and not a concrete type. Uh, the dependency inversion principle allows something external to choose the implementation. Again, Hollywood, don't call us, we call you. The, the component itself doesn't new, it is provided with those dependencies. The component doesn't care like who provides it or really what provides it. There's something external to the use of that component that needs to make that decision and should know the functionality of both the components, the dependencies he's choosing and the components he's passing them to. Um, then the interface separation pattern, so different from the segregation principle, helps keep abstractions abstract. And if you follow these three things, they're hard to follow, but they will help you create abstractions that really are abstract, and you don't begin to leak um, concrete things into your abstractions. So a simple thing there would be to, hey, I have this, um, this library that I'm using, and I, I can kind of create this wrapping, wrapping interface around it, but it really uses these types to come out of the library. But So in my interface, uh, it seems like I have to return the type that's defined in the library. And um, at that point, you'd have to have an interface that, that has a dependency on that assembly to have that um, type be provided, right? And there's ways around requiring that. And if you keep all of your interfaces in interface-only assemblies, you only allow interface-only assemblies to depend on other interface-only assemblies and system assemblies, and then you try to minimize the number of system assemblies that you are allowing that those that collection to depend on, um, you prevent that leakage into your abstraction, which begins to bond that abstraction to the a specific thing, that library dependency. So again, the read-only reference, um, when I create uh, the property that holds that dependency, Private get only is the deferred default or preferred default. And preferred, preferring that immutability helps with concurrency and lifetime uh, compatibility down the road. Uh, if you need mutable properties, uh, you'll need to make that implementation thread safe for singleton lifetimes, possibly. So the singleton lifetime ends up being, hey, I only have one copy of this thing and everything in the system is gonna use that copy. And if everything in the system is on multiple threads, that potentially is using it and setting things um, on top of each other. And then kind of as a note, here in the bottom three lines, in our example, we had a plain old data um, implementation of my component settings. It uses git and set. But at the interface level, the interface is git only. And so everything that that thing is gonna be provided to um, as an abstraction, really won't have access to to mutate something inside of it. 
sort of. The my component is using the get only view through the abstraction. So in dependency selection, something needs to provide that dependency. And as we kind of saw with the my component, I had two, two examples. You can new those components and their dependencies right there in various ways. Um, if you do that and you provide sort of a single location where that, that new management is, is happening, in general, the term for that is the composition route, and that's a Mark Seaman term from that dependency injection book. It sort of helps um, keep news, the sort of what Adam just said, the new is glue. It keeps that glue in a confined space where you can manage that as being, I'm going to manage dependencies. I'm going to do it manually through newing them myself, but I'm going to do it in a small number of places, a single place. And that's going to be the composition route for the app. Doing this, uh, Mark Seaman calls this sort of pure dependency injection. He used to call it poor man's dependency injection. And actually argues that this is preferable in many cases. Uh, that you don't need a container and you don't need uh, a fancy dependency injection container or library. You can do this. And it becomes, to me, one of the biggest arguments to say, when you talk about dependencies um, and managing them, to kind of avoid dependency injection because it kind of gets really uh, quickly related to containers and the use of containers is can potentially be contentious. So at the bottom, we can use a container to do things to help provide the, and, and select provide selected dependencies. And some notes on some anti-patterns in dependency management. Service locator, depending on the dependency provider itself and conforming provider, conforming container. The service locator um, has been described by Martin Fowler, a well-respected author and community member. Um, but it's generally considered an anti-pattern, and the reason is because in my constructor here, I don't have, I'm missing sort of the parameter that in the constructor um, and using the constructor to, to declare my dependencies, I'm, I'm missing that. And I can have other, you know, constructors that potentially have it, but in this particular case, the external thing isn't really um, providing it for me. The special thing, the service locator, is providing it. And if you start to use this, then you potentially start to leak using it more often and you just say, well, I actually don't even need this property there. I can use it in the do work. And I'll just use it as a local variable there and grab it from the service locator. And in general, um, you just kind of quickly lose track of the dependency graph that you can um, construct by just making a statement that, hey, all of our dependencies are going to be constructor parameters. Similarly, depending on the dependency provider, I have a component, why don't I just grab the container and like resolve stuff from it? Um, it is very tempting to do this, and sometimes you think it's it is like uh, so valuable that you'll sort of ignore this thing, and I, I that's sort of this spot where you kind of get into a, a a spot where I do think it has a true argumentative. Um, uh, well, there's a pro and con to both of them. Um, one of the sort of patternized fixes is to say, hey, really, I don't want this dependency resolver to resolve the dependencies uh, like this and calling it a dependency resolver. What I really want to do is somehow make my declaration of needing this guy to resolve and resolve and resolve again. Um, potentially down, like down here, and resolve, resolve, resolve. Can I do this with a factory instead? That hey, this factory and the factory, the idea of the factory um, and its API and language is the thing that potentially I can change this dependency from this dependency resolver to a factory, and this becomes hey, my my type conversion factory create or provide or whatever. Uh, it's potentially a better pattern to talk talk about. 
Uh, and then the conforming provider, uh, this is, I just said, it's <coughs> potentially this is tempting, especially if you abstract the resolver. Uh, abstracting the resolver is pretty simple, but there ends up being a number of uh, features in various uh, containers that you end up uh, running up against where you're like, okay, well, how do I do this and make this work with potentially other containers? One of those particular areas, parameter overrides. I want to resolve this thing out of a container, but for this very particular dependency, the second one, named this, I want you to provide something different this time. And if you try to start abstracting that, it sort of leads you down this sort of hole that your abstraction becomes really hard to, uh, to conform all the other containers to. And that's just the resolver. If you try to do that with the registrar of like how you actually register a particular type to be implement or a particular type that implements a particular interface and you want the container to provide that when you ask for it um, or when it is asked for um, there's a various number of ways various different containers allow you to make those registrations uh, and it becomes really hard to abstract that so trying to do this is hard and, in most cases, unnecessary. Uh, many still try this, including Microsoft ASP.NET uh, Core is one of them. They have one, and I do this. So but wouldn't that make it impossible to use the just new the thing? Because then there is no container, right? When you knew all your, when you manually glue it together using just new, there is no container in that scenario, right? Yeah, right, correct. Right. So that, that's always available. That yeah, but if you have a dependency on some sort of container concept. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's true. You uh, over. Yeah, the, um, the resolver is the one that you'll most likely want to depend on, just because it's basically a type factory, and it allows you to, you know, where the, the factory arguments are type information. And so there's potentially, uh, it, it can create the type you ask for. And it does so in a way that even can go and create its dependencies and the, the complete graph that it actually needs. And it's really nice sort of thing to say, why don't I just use this guy as my factory? And in general, when you sort of say, I'm going to redeclare that dependency on that resolver as a dependency on that factory, you still can implement a factory that uses that resolver. Does that make sense? Well, I'm coming from C, C and C++ that does, definitely doesn't have anything built in like that, right? So you can still use dependency injection to some extent in those languages, but you don't have that whole resolver thing. So you have to know it. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to look at um, the Boost DI as an experimental uh, library in Boost that is for C++14, and I don't know enough about it to talk about it, but. I have a link in here towards the end, I guess. Um, so dependency injection. Um, you don't need a dependency injection container. I hope that's, I hope you all believe that. You can do things yourself and the whole entire solid and drive principles and uh, defining single responsibility abstractions and implementations is something that you should do to create these industrial strength components to build on top of. But then when you actually want to stitch them together uh, to create sort of larger services or an application itself, um, that is the, uh, the, the term for doing that stitching together and providing those dependencies is dependency injection regardless of whether you're using a container or not. Sort of the poor man versus the, or the pure DI versus the container DI. So you don't need a dependency injection container uh, to take advantage of most of what I just said in the previous slides. But they are magic, and potentially is a double-edged sword, so wield it carefully. So as an example of the pure dependency injection, or containerless, we're going to new things up ourselves. <coughs> you basically develop components using solid drive principles without assuming con the container exists. Sort of always do that. Uh, then. Within your application, you have a sort of a well-defined spot to term it the composition route. 
and then you manually knew the implementations that you would like to provide to dependencies sort of down the, um, uh, down the chain. So, the control of the lifetime, the, the new, and how you actually provide those dependencies is sort of manual. You're keeping track of variable values. The lifetime of those objects that you are newing is sort of uh, managed by yourself as well, and the various scopes that you create and where you assign those variables. So if you're creating them in um, you know, certain scopes and then you're, they're out of scope uh, locally or um, as, a, as a member to the composition roots object or as a static across the entire application, those all sort of control the lifetime of those objects that you will, you know, pass to the uh, um, things that you need as you as you need them. So, in a simple sort of program, console program that's a batch mode thing, um, it's pretty simple. Usually, you'll create a bunch of stuff, have at least one item at the end that sort of collects a, a couple of its dependencies, which really depend on the entire chain of what you've collected, and then you just say do work or run, right? But in like a web server, you get a request each time, and you sort of each time you get to decide: Do I reuse, you know, this this object that I've newed because it's a member of um, uh, the class that's doing the newing, or it's a scope? Um, or sorry, it's a, it's a static that exists uh, somewhere else in just a single instance across the entire application. So that's controlling the lifetime in uh, the pure injection. So in general, the output sort of like some main interface, some do work thing, or you know, in a web server, it's some request for, uh, handler, and in a batch mode, it's usually some for an instance of a program class. And then at the bottom, you use that main interface as the in, uh, entry point to your program or to your request. And so with a dependency injection container. You do the, the top line is exactly the same. You develop and create components. And then you have a, a spot for actually newing the container and then registering a bunch of type, um, basically type pairs. For this interface or abstraction, I want the container to provide um, this implementation. And when asked for it, it will do what it needs to create that implementation, including um, going to its constructor, the implementation's constructor, figuring out what its, its dependencies are, what collection of parameters do I need to pass to this constructor I'm going to new, and then asking its sort of self, the, its container, hey, do I have those things? Do I know how to create those things? If, you don't know how to, if it doesn't know how to create one of those, um, that construction fails with a thrown exception. And if it um, does, it will create them all or provide them all and uh, the final new will be returned to you and the lifetime of those particular implementation instances is determined by the registration of that instance with the container so in general you can sort of say for this implementation for this interface I want you to always provide this implementation and I want you to do so in various lifetime uh, configurations, like a singleton, which would create create it once and provide the same one back to it every time it's asked, and various other sort of scoped um, lifetimes. So in general, uh, not every container does this exactly, but it's good practice regardless. Um, so this is sort of the registration. You just need to say, hey. Uh, I, I, it, sorry, container, I want you to, to provide this implementation for this abstraction when asked for it. And you can do things, special things that are uh, usually in a container specific way on how you can tweak what parameters are actually provided to that um, constructor. So we've seen construction parameters that are abstractions, but what if the last one is an integer? And so do you register an integer into the container? In general, you don't. Uh, my, uh, there's ways to configure the container with data that, that tells it what to do. 
Uh, usually the simplest thing is you just provide like a construction lambda, which you are given a resolver and you resolve the first two abstractions and then you just say the int is read from somewhere or is this inline value is this. So that's how you can potentially tweak the, the construction method that the container actually uses. Uh, you specify the lifetime of registration, like, hey, do this as a singleton object or a transient object or a thread scoped object or <coughs> various ones, and not every container has all of those. Um, and right here, when you are registering, you should, although some containers allow it, you should not resolve something out of the container while you want to register more. Basically, what you do is register, then finalize, and after that, you cannot find, or you cannot register more things. You can only resolve from, or uh, create a nested resolution scope. You can basically finalize and say, but I want a new scope with these things set up, and you sort of can get this hierarchy of containers. And then you, in general, resolve, uh, have a single resolve that says, from the container, give me this. The container is responsible for providing those dependencies as you've hooked, you've hooked them up. Uh, you have the item that you're about to call, like do work or handle request, and right here you forget that this DA container sort of ever existed. You have that item, now you use it, and you call do work or handle request, right? So I'm shooting for 8.30. So with that said, the, uh, there are a number of dependency injection containers. Uh, they are feature rich, code config, file config, uh, uh, by convention config, you can sort of hand a container a file or an assembly and say scan all of these, uh, scan all of the types in this assembly and, all, and register them all as uh, this interface. Um, you can reg make registrations by name. And so when you ask for an unnamed one, you wouldn't get a name, you know, something that's named, you have to know the name of it to Hey, give me the high settings provider named Mike. Uh, for containers, that a lot of feature and parity. The default lifetime is different uh, in various containers. Disposable handling, um, which is kind of like deconstruction in .NET, uh, is different. Uh, various .NET requirements going to do this in um, .NET 3 or 4.5 or what do I actually need? Uh, for .NET, Unity, Autofact, Castle Windsor, Tiny, IOC, more. C++, I meant to look into the Boost DI. For D, there's something called Houdinus. There's a lot in Java and others. So this is going to be quick. Um, basically, some examples of how to do, th do registrations with components. And then in the end, um, how I'm hooking up my components by declaring a collection of components that I call a dependency bundle, or mod, dependency module, the module's kind of overloaded. <clears throat> so an application is really just an object graph. At some point, I'm going to call do work on this thing, and there is a number of dependencies it needs to do its work. And that sort of connection between one and all of these other components kind of presents this graph. The whole process of providing those dependencies called dependency injection with with or without a container. Hopefully you read this. Sort of a um, thing on the left we've seen before. It's the pure, I'm just going to new my component, but to do that I need to give it a my component settings interface. I've chosen on the left to do it from settings provider and I'm going to scope to this prefix and then I'm going to use it, get the basics from app config and then I'm going to use the system type conversion provider. On the right, um, I'm going to create a new dependency injection container. And then I'm going to register types. I'm going to register the system change type conversion provider as the type conversion provider. So the top line there sort of is what you're doing to tell this container that when you're asked for a type conversion provider, provide this guy. And I don't really specify a life cycle and would be the default life cycle of that guy. In general, that's transient. I'll get a new one every time I ask for it. And um, where is that guy needed? He's needed right here at this sort of root level type settings provider. 
And so just continuing on, I want the app config to be my basic settings provider. I want this general type settings provider to be this guy. Sorry, this guy. And then I have the component settings from settings provider where I sort of scope. Um, uh, I scope settings to this prefix path to my component. And then this right here is the uh, customization of hey, when this container actually tries to new this guy, it really is going to just find that I've registered a lambda, and then it's going to call this lambda. And so, but it's going to give me the container it's using to resolve stuff out of. And right there, I can say, hey, create this thing, and right here, resolve the I type settings provider, and just provide this hard-coded path right here every time. So I don't have to, like, register this string to be provided with the um, with the container. I just say, container, when you get a request for this, call this function, and I'll do things to uh, provide that that implementation. So what is the container? Who implements the container? Is that like a built-in, or where does it come from? So that's in general the Unity, Autofac, um, Castle Windsor library. Is it all called the same, or is it one of them not there? Uh, I just named it generic DI builder. Is it possible to set that up in a text file rather than in code? Yeah, so that would be the features of the container. It kind of depends, but I think most of them support that, um, where you can make those mappings in code. And then, so down here, um, finally I register my component as the I my component. Finalize the builder into a resolution scope. Resolve the I my component, which will create this, which will create that, which will create, right? And then I use that to do work. So I have seven slides left. So basically, we have this on the right. Um, and it would be nice to simplify this, because this sort of gets long and involved, and uh, the number of components grow. And it gets pretty ugly quickly. So. Autofac and probably other containers could uh, have an idea of a module, which is really just, hey, I need this object that's really going to uh, know about and register multiple components on sort of one go. So the bundle of component registrations, um, they provide making a standard set of components easier. Define bundles close to, you can define the bundles close to where the component code is defined. And it's easier to reuse those bundles across applications. So something simple, I have a, at the top a dependency bundle, which just really has an abstract register. I create another definition of one called a component dependencies, which is a dependency bundle. My component dependencies is a component dependencies. And the register function that is right here is exactly what I showed you in the previous slide. It's just that now I can use it like this. Create the builder the same, the, the container. Create a bundle, the, my component dependencies. Use that bundle's instance to configure whatever it needs to in the container. As the application, I don't really care too much about that. I just want to use, I just want to know that my component's available. Then finalize, resolve my component, and then use my component. And so, similar to the previous slide, where I had a, you know, here are a number of um, ideas of industrial components. We can bundle them into these, those components and their, you know, most of their requirements into dependency bundles. And you kind of get to something like this. Deployment dependencies has two different selections. I can use sort of the local deployment, which does stuff that's easy to local host on my dev workstation. But then I can sub substitute that with the Azure um, dependency pack, and I, I just use that when I'm in deploying to Azure and down the line. So, two more, three more, two more. So in practice, where I've gotten to is defining components, eventually figuring out where the uh, if there's a bundle that this component is is. Um, you know, really implements whether it's sort of, hey, is this component really a part of a diagnostic bundle or a authentication uh, authorization bundle or 
configuration bundle? And if so, maybe create a new implementation of some bundle family that's already there. And once I have that family idea with these choices of implementation, sort of the my, I, sort of an aha moment happened in which I can now reuse all the composition, all the uh, composition root or DI container concepts that we learned, except with the items that I'm going to register in there be bundles. You're not going to have bundles depend on other bundles. Make a, a final resolve of that sort of root level bundle. <clears throat> so I have sort of a final resolve of that root level bundle, which is really just its purpose is to configure an empty container, which I resolve my worker out of and then do the work. So on the right, uh, so over here, dependency bundle becomes a little more uh, complex. I have a bunch of bundles that it can have, and when I call register, it really just does register for all, these, for the, all the containers in there, right? All the bundles in this bundles container collection. Then I define, hey, I have program dependencies, for example, which is a dependency bundle. And um, sorry, this definition right here is what I consider sort of a family, uh, a module family or a dependency bundle family. And I'm going to have program dependencies. This is abstract, so I'm going to need to implement one of these. And this guy just passes the, the bundles through to here so that when I register the base, they get registered. Then down here I say, for my program dependencies, is a program dependencies, I depend on component dependencies and this guy can be longer. I also depend on um, other services, configuration and um, interop services or some other services provided through a dependency. <clears throat> and really, I just take this guy and pass it to the base so that when this guy's register gets called, this component dependency is there and it gets registered into the, con the component container that I'm, I'm using. And so on the right, my main becomes Use the same thing, I uh, didn't replace this guy, but this is the DI builder, Unity Dependency Builder, specifically Unity. Create this guy, but create it as the bundle container. Then I register component dependencies, use my component dependencies, and I have to pass this guy in to configure this guy. Um, then register as program dependencies, use my program dependencies finalize that bundle container, resolve program dependencies, which will um, give me both this guy and this guy. And when I um, call this register, I'll get, reg I'll, you know, the, the for each bundle in this bundles will register all those bundles that that sort of bundle depends on. And so once all of those bundles are registered into the component container right here. This, this DI builder is a component container. Finalize that guy and I can resolve my component. And so this up and down becomes something that is powerful in a sense that now you have bundles that are defined in various, you have these families, then you can have an implementation of that family. So I have the you know configuration bundle. I have Azure configuration bundle and um, local JSON configuration bundle and local app config bundle. And somewhere I say, hey, my program just needs a configuration bundle. And somewhere I will need to choose that by doing this. Then this resolve gives me that same object hierarchy of bundles. And I can iterate through that create my component container, and then resolve the actual sort of single component I need to do the work and process the request. And I can do that um, at various layers in a sense of saying, um, these bundles kind of define what is a console batch app. These bundles kind of define, define what is a uh, web API app. And then I can have a set of registrations there that kind of map to team standards. So I can say, I really want to create like a 
web, I really want to create a web API um, application. For that, I know that we do that a lot. So there's this sort of bundle that is a root level bundle that is a web API host dependencies. And I can make a, uh, a set of, or I can make a call to a, let's say, team level function that says, for my team, a set up that standard set of dependencies for web API. And then right there for my business um, logic of my app, I can do some things that say override these two or three um, and add on these other ones that add, add the business logic of my particular app. And let that sort of hierarchy do the work of um, creating a, a potentially complex set of component dependencies that is used down here as the resolve my component do work. So you can kind of just, if you imagine that, what I'm trying to get to is, hey, I need a, I need a dependency bundle container. Here I just say, hey, use my team's standard web API application set of bundles um, for Azure. It goes and chooses a bunch of like standards for my team. I say, okay, override a few of those and tack in a few more business dependencies for my application. And then I really just finalize, um, resolve the web API host dependencies, register that into my empty DI container, and use the items from there that I actually need. That's the end.